All right, welcome back everybody to uh, the final spring 2022 semester meeting of the online peace science colloquium. So if you're joining us for the first time, uh, I'll let you know a little bit about uh, who we are. So we're affiliated with the Peace Science Society International and this online colloquium is a place to share the great uh, research that goes on before and after the society's annual meeting. Um, so my name is Brad Smith. I'm one of the co-coordinators of this online speaker series. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University and uh, my colleague Cassie Dorf, who's also an assistant professor at Vanderbilt uh, is the other co-coordinator of this meeting. So, um, so this week, we're really excited to have a great paper uh, titled Anger and Political Conflict Dynamics by uh, Keith Schnackenberg, who's an associate professor at WashU, and Carly Wayne, who's an assistant professor at WashU. Um, we also have uh, two wonderful discussants. So joining us uh, this is a special occasion, we have the founder of the Online Peace Science Colloquium, Emily Ritter, who is uh, an associate professor at Vanderbilt University. And we also have uh, David Siegel, who's a professor of political science and public policy uh, at Duke University. So uh, with that, uh, the format for the rest of the, the colloquium meeting, Carly will give a 15 or 20 minute, um, she'll give a 15 or 20 minute presentation of the paper. Uh, then we'll, uh, we'll collect some, you know, five or 10 minutes of discussant comments from Emily and David, and then we'll just have a conversation about the paper with the remainder of our time. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Carly. Awesome, thank you. I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen and start it. Okay, uh, so thank you guys so much for for agreeing to serve as discussants and for, for taking this paper into the colloquium. This is actually a paper that we've been working on for I think over a year now, just trying to start struggling to get the, the model exactly how we want it and um, really incorporate emotions function in um, in politics and in, in life into these uh, formal strategic model of political conflict. Um, and so this is the paper that we're going to be presenting today. And so the main puzzle that spurred us to do this work is to basically understand how a behavioral assumption like anger uh, functions in a strategic setting. And there's several examples in, in the IR context or conflict context where we think about leaders or states as behaving angrily and the implications this might have for, for political conflict. So there's angry rhetoric surrounding China and how that's gonna influence what China is going to do over, for example, here in this case, the Solomon Islands. And of course, there's been a lot of rhetoric over the recent Ukraine-Russia conflict, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Biden at the State of the Union kind of very angrily denouncing the invasion and then in turn people have talked about Putin as being angry about how this conflict is going and how that might impact his uh, strategic choices that he makes in, in this type of setting. And so these are the kinds of questions that we're interested in, in exploring in this paper. And in particular, we're, we're trying to basically bridge what we know empirically from experimental studies of how emotion functions in political conflict with a more deductive formal approach that takes the kind of strategic interaction part of conflict really, really seriously. And so this is kind of following this call for a modeling dialogue that by Meyerson back to promote that over to the 90s. Um, and in this particular case, um, the application that we're thinking about is conflict onset and uh, the security dilemma. And when we say security dilemma, we basically mean that states or actors might gain benefits from cooperating, but they're basically uncertain over others' intentions and are concerned about being taken advantage of. And so this can engender actions that risk conflict or make conflict more likely. And so what we inject into this discussion of the security dilemma is, well, what happens when you have decision makers that can and do get angry? How does that influence the strategic calculations both of the individuals that have become angry and the other actors that they're that they're engaging with in this context? Um, we know from the literature on psychology, in psychology, particularly cognitive appraisal theories of emotion, that anger is likely to be triggered when an event is deemed negative uh, relative to some expectations that an individual has, and that this negative event has to be appraised as being caused by the purposeful unfair actions of another individual, another state, another actor. 
And as far as the effects of anger, a host of experimental studies have shown that it increases things like aggression, uh, punitive preferences, including the willingness to pay personal costs to enact punitive uh, actions against another wrongdoer, and may also shape information processing in, in kind of pernicious ways, increasing the reliance on priors, increasing susceptibility to motivated reasoning, and, and things like that. And so, from the empirical or experimental work on anger, we know that preferences um, when you are angry shift, but these preferences depend on the beliefs that you have about who you're engaging with. The problem is that these beliefs in turn depend on the strategies that other players have taken towards you uh, in, in the game. And so basically preferences and beliefs become endogenous to the actions of the game. And so this leads us to use a psychological game framework to model this kind of interaction. And so the basic model set up, we borrow from Asimov Blue and Woods, he's 2014 paper. We use a game where you have overlapping generations of agents uh, from two groups, A and B, that are gonna interact strategically with each other over time. Basically in each period, one player uh, from uh, each group will be active and is going to choose two actions. They can choose um, a conciliatory action or an aggressive action. And they're going to apply that choice both to the agent that went before them in the previous group and the agent that's going to come after them in the, in, um, the other group. Uh, and so before they choose this action, that the, these actions that they're going to take, they receive some kind of signal of what, had, what the previous player's action towards them had been in the past round. Um, and this is going to inform in part the, their choice that they make. The problem is that this signal is, is noisy. Um, it is accurate if the previous player has taken an aggressive action. So if the player took an aggressive action, you know that that happened. Um, but if the player before you on the other side took a conciliatory action, that signal is noisy. And so it, it might come through that the player was aggressive when they weren't. And then in terms of the player types, we have two types of players. Um, you can be hostile or friendly. Hostile types have a utility function that basically leads them to always prefer aggressive actions. Uh, but friendly types have some coordination incentives. So the game is it's kind of similar to a stag hunt in that respect. And so we have three main findings that come out of the paper uh, right now out of this model. The first is that um, basically friendly types are going to pursue conciliatory and aggressive actions with some positive probability. And, but this is going to depend on whether they believe the other side is likely to reciprocate that conciliatory action. And it's also going to depend on how high that cost is for the friendly side of taking a conciliatory action and then basically being the recipient of an aggressive action in return. It's kind of like the sucker payoff, so to speak. Um, so this is a relatively straightforward proposition. I think where our findings get a little bit more interesting is with proposition two. And so again, I should have mentioned this with proposition one, we, we have this assumption of a favorable prior, which means like to start out, they, they think that there's a high likelihood that the other side is um, a friendly type. And so if we assume that prior, um, then we cannot have perpetual conflict in equilibrium. Basically, there's going to be some friendly type who's going to take a conciliatory action with some positive probability after they get an aggressive signal. And the intuition behind this result is essentially because uh, anger in our model is based on these behavioral findings that suggest that anger is triggered when there is this negative gap between your expectations of what's going to happen and, and what actually happens, that you'll reach a point in the model where you're going to update sufficiently that you now believe that you are playing against a hostile type. And so you're no longer going to be expecting uh, conciliatory action. And so when that opponent takes an aggressive action against you, you don't get angry following that action. And so with some positive probability, you might take a conciliatory action if it benefits you in other, in other ways. Uh, and then our third uh, main proposition is that there are actually some kind of benefits to anger for 
for the group that uh, is prone to anger. So we have this term in our model, which is alpha, which is basically your sensitivity to the psychological preferences, the, the anger preferences in your, in your utility calculation, how important those preferences are to you. And as you increase that parameter, it's kind of fulfilling your anger preferences becomes more and more important to you relative to material preferences. Um, you're going to behave more aggressively, perhaps naturally, um, but other members of the other group are gonna act less aggressively. And the reason for this is that um, being more sensitive to anger actually decreases the, the informativeness of the signal um, that your aggressive actions send about your type. Uh, so this means that the other group, when they see this aggressive action from you are less likely to conclude that it's you're taking this action because you are a hostile type. Uh, you might just be taking this action because you are particularly angry. Uh, and so it kind of muddies the signal that you send. Um, so that is the basic formulation of the model, but there are several extensions that we've considered so far, each of which I think makes a separate contribution here. Uh, one is the psychological game framework is quite complicated. Um, and Keith can tell you uh, a lot more about, about how complicated it is. But uh, there are questions about, is, is this really necessary? What is the value add of, of doing this psychological game construct versus just a more simple model of, of you know, anger, increasing punitive preferences or something like that. Um, and what we find when we, when we compare to simple anger is you actually can just get this kind of perpetual conflict where just conflict, just once the anger is triggered, it just, it, it persists um, continually. And so the psychological game framework actually gives us a more nuanced understanding of how conflicts can actually de-escalate after a certain point in time. Uh, our formulation in the main model of groups is pretty um, simplistic. Either you're all hostile or all friendly. That's obviously a simplification of, of the real world, but all of those same results hold if you kind of make the groups have proportions of types rather than, than all zero or all one. Another uh, extension that we toyed with was providing more information about the history of the game to individuals. Um, so in our model, agents are operating in a pretty information poor environment. And so that may explain why anger plays such an important role in shaping preferences. What happens if we actually just have more information about what happened in the past? Maybe that will mute the, the effects of anger on, on equilibrium. And we actually find that that's kind of the opposite of what happens, or at least that's, that's not what happens. Um, if you know more information about the history, there are some, at least some cases in which it actually increases your potential for anger uh, following this noisy signal. Um, and that's because if you, if you know more about the history of the game and you, you now think very strongly that you're facing a friendly type and all of a sudden they take this aggressive action to you, you're even more angry because the gap between your expectations and what happens is even larger. Um, another aspect of anger that we wanted to incorporate is this, this idea that anger is most likely to be triggered, not necessarily just when someone else does something negative towards you, but when you attribute that negative action to their character or their intentions, um, rather than um, kind of a product of circumstances. So for example, if you think that someone is taking a bad action to, towards you, but it's because of something you did or because they're confused or because, you know, something like that, that's different than saying, well, you're taking a negative action because you're just like a bad person. You're not good. Um, and so when we add in this concern for intentions, uh, we actually see that players can be more forgiving in the wake of an aggressive signal if they attribute that aggressive signal as a response by the other side to receiving an aggressive signal from one, their own side. Basically. Um, and then, oh yeah, I said six extensions, then went five. The last extension that we do um, is to turn to look at the informational effects of anger. So uh, in our model, we focus mainly on the role of anger in changing preferences. And that we, we uh, when we become angry, we are concerned for relative gains. We don't want the other side to benefit. And so we get like a psychological payoff from them being punished as opposed to uh, benefiting. Um, but there are these other effects of anger that I alluded to at the beginning, which is that it also shapes how we process information about our environment. 
in, in potentially pernicious ways. And so what happens if we model anger not as a thing that changes preferences, but a thing that changes how we respond to signals? And so to do this, we basically borrow uh, a motivated reasoning model uh, from some of Keith's other uh, work with other co-authors. Um, to show how this informational pathway might affect conflict. And we actually find quite similar results uh, using this informational uh, route of, of anger, but the mechanism is, is different. And so we can, we can talk a bit more about that extension too, if that's something that you're interested in. And I'll just close um, by going back to the initial example. Um, we think that this has implications not only for things like the security dilemma and great power politics and, and things like that, even though that is the kind of main frame that we use in the paper. Uh, we think this has applications to other kinds of conflict settings where basically agents have incentives to cooperate, but also uh, concerns about treating being treated fairly or being taken advantage of and the, the ways in which that dynamic might shape emotions and therefore change preferences and change the strategic nature of, um, of their interactions. So we're looking forward to getting your comments and, and thank you very much. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen, but if you have questions on specific things, I can throw the slides up again. Yeah. Um, awesome. And then you wanted me to say kind of where we're at. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so if you could just, before we go, move to the discussing comments, yeah, I'm just, you know, kind of to set the tone for the discussion, like what are, sure. where are you guys at with the paper? What kind of feedback are you looking for? What would be most useful to talk about? Sure. So Keith, feel free to jump in too. But um, uh, we are hoping to send this out for review this summer. And so, you know, we might uh, make modifications to the model. We'd be particularly interested, I think, in which extens extensions you find particularly valuable. If there are extensions you think are missing that we should swap out, uh, things like that. Um, in the framing of the paper, uh, if you think this security dilemma frame is the best way to go, or if you would uh, think a more like a more general conflict frame is, is better suited to this model. Those are some of my questions. Keith, do you have other things that you'd like to focus on? Uh, yeah, so I guess a, a, a secondary thing we're trying to do in this paper is uh, is uh, persuade people that this psychological games uh, technology is useful. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, we might be interested in, in sort of comments on that like sort of methodological pitch of the paper as well. Yeah, I think the paper we sent you is like conclusion TBD. And so <laughs> we'll be kind of adding some of those implications things in. But yeah. Thanks. Okay, cool. Um, so so I'll turn it over now uh, to the discussion. So Emily and Dave, uh, Emily, if you could get us started off and just, you know, take, we've got a good amount of time. We've got 40 minutes left. So, you know, take 10 minutes or so, um, just kind of, you know, download all your discussant comments as much as you want to um and then we'll with whatever we have left we'll um we'll have a free flowing conversation okay. uh thanks um and thanks to keith and carly for sharing the paper it was fun to read um the <clears throat> i don't have a full 10 minutes worth of comments because i feel like this is a fairly um polished paper and i especially um you know i of course I did, but I especially enjoyed the model and <laughs> um, the uh, and what you're doing here. I think that there's a real value as IR and conflict studies are turning more and more to behavioral studies um, of, of doing this exercise of bringing um, uh, psychological aspects of behavior, uh, of political behavior in conflict into um, a framework of strategic thinking. Um, because frequently these are very divorced from one another. Um, I, 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 um, it's one of my main beefs with most of the um, behavioral literature that they're not including strategic thinking in it, even though that's obviously a psychological behavior. So um, they, um, so I, I, I'm, I'm on board. I'm, I'm really excited about it. Um, and I think that right now as it's, written the lit review doesn't do enough to talk about why that's so important why introducing 
so that's how I frame it in my mind when I'm reading this paper is why is it, what is it that we learn about what people will actually do and how they'll respond in a strategic setting when they're also thinking about the psychology of the other player. Um, and I think that right now, the way your literature review is written is very much like, these are these other models and here's how we build from them. These are these other models and here's how we build from them. Um, and so you do a great job of setting up the literature references and um, comparisons so that we know exactly how you're innovating on a technical element, but not, and why you made the decisions that you did, but it doesn't really draw us into this, like, why do we need to know this? Why is this a, a model you needed to write? Um, because the way it's laid out now, it kind of feels like you needed to write this model because other people haven't done it exactly this way. And I and that's not how I read your contribution. I think your contribution is that conflict is strategic behavior <laughs> and strategic behavior means strategic anticip anticipation and um, making decisions based on beliefs and low information environments but we're not including psychological elements in almost any of our conflict models that are thinking about that strategic behavior. And I think that that's a, a, a very pithy frame that's kind of getting lost here. Um, and I think that you've got, I think it's really easy to make that case that people aren't doing that um, and need to be doing that. Um, and so it's something that you know, strategic think uh, strategic scholars need to be thinking about strategic conflict scholars or political economy of conflict scholars need to be incorporating the implications of two players that have psychological issues, right? Um, and the behavioral literature needs to be thinking more about strategic thinking, right? Uh, and so, um, yeah. So why do we need to model the effects of behavior, of the, the effects of anger, as opposed to just talking about anger and conflict? Um, <clears throat> one of the questions that I had as I was reading kind of speaks to one of the, the first points that Carly raised as an, an extension, um, which is, I was thinking as I was going through this that I, I couldn't, it wasn't obvious to me why there was an advantage of using a sequential game um, with the psychological game theory frame uh, or assumptions as opposed to an agent-based model. Um, this maybe, I think this is mostly a question of ignorance, but I kept feeling like the model should have been an agent-based model as I was reading it and I couldn't quite pull out the, the benefits of doing it this way instead. Um, and this may be something that Dave could speak to a little bit better than, than I could, um, but I think you can do more to talk about, um, as Carly said, maybe I just wanna hear Keith talk about the benefits of using this framework um, because I, I felt like it wasn't coming through and maybe that's just because the conclusion was TBD. So um, yeah, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Um, the other major point I think that I, I wanted to bring up, um, I need to find it in my notes. I'm sorry, I didn't put them all on one page because it's the end of the semester and I'm barely surviving. Um, um, I would like to hear more about the extension um, that Carly mentioned about extending the information environment. Um, I, as it's written, I feel like the, what the model does is allow you, is, is each player is getting a new draw each time of the, who their opponent is gonna be in the next round. And so they, um, everything is dependent on the prior, right? Um, and I feel like what is more likely is we should be, um, so in the context of a new leader, for instance, right? So if we're looking at like Scott Wolford's models of when new leaders take over for in positions and they come into an existing pre-existing crisis, um, that's not really an entirely new draw because they're constrained in some ways along the lines of prior leaders, um, but it is a new draw in terms of resolve. And so um, it's, 
I, I feel like um, having a more extensive information environment should essentially make you more forgiving. Um, partially because in a given pool, even if you've faced a whole bunch of aggressive types, it seems like there's more a, a chance that you would, that if you're drawing a totally new leader that not somebody you've already played with, you'd be more likely to draw a conciliary type even if you've got a largely aggressive pool. Um, and I, I don't quite see the logic that Carly suggested of being more aggressive um, with a longer informational history. So I think that's something that I would wanna see a discussion of in, in, the, in the conclusion or as a, an addendum to the model section. I, I, would, I think that would be something that would, I think it's something that more people are gonna be drawn to. Um, are, are, are triggered by. And then the last thing I wanted to say um, was, um, sorry. Um, so in thinking about your probability, or I'm sorry, not your probability, your proposition two, the, um, you find that, correct me if I'm wrong, jump in if I'm wrong, but you find that if, if friendly, if the, if a friendly type has a favorable prior about the likelihood of conciliatory, of the pool being largely conciliatory um, in the other group, they will be more likely to take a friendly action or conciliatory action, even if they faced an aggressive action in the prior, with the prior opponent. Um, and I, and I, I couldn't figure out quite what the interpretation was. Is it because they expect probabilistically, right? So my interpretation of the, of the favorable prior is that because the, the player believes that, because player T believes that overall the group is largely conciliatory of opponents that it's facing, then even if T minus one was aggressive, they should expect T plus one to be on average more conciliatory. Um, so is it that the prior is dominating their expectations of the likely future draw or is it because, as Carly stated in the presentation, the expectation is lower as to what they should expect from the opponent, and then therefore they're more likely, less likely to be angry when they're poked. And I, I can't tell from the model which interpretation I should take, right? Is it that their referent has changed, or it's that they have a probabilistic prior and they think, and they're just thinking probabilistic. Does that make sense? What I'm asking. Um, I, I feel like um, overall, you could talk more throughout the model section about perceptions. And I know that that's something that you can't explicitly study in the model, but I think that the, that the what assumptions are being made about the player's perceptions of what's going on would help me clarify kind of how you're drawing the conclusions that you are. So. Um, I think it's cool. And I definitely hope you get it out of this summer because I think it's awesome. Um, and my points are generally like clarification points more than they are critiques. So um, I, I think this is awesome. Thanks, Emily. That's great. Um, Brad, did you want us to respond to Emily's first or have David go first? Yeah, you, you can, you're welcome to respond, especially if there's something you want to, yeah. Yeah, go, go ahead and respond if you want. We've got like so much time. Um, yeah, go for it. Yeah, um, well, I'll let, I'll let Keith answer some of the questions on the, the model stuff, but I think you're right that at the, like at the front end right now, basically we didn't want to, we were worried with behavioral models of like kind of accidentally stepping in it <laughs> and pissing off one or both camps, um, you know, like, so I think you're right that we probably could say strongly, more strongly, what we think the two sides are lacking and why it's so critical to do it this way. I don't um, think that you need to take out what you've done. I think what yeah. you've helpful, but I think you before that right. section of like 
what's why why do we need to answer this question? Yeah, I think I think that that's right. Um, so thank you, uh, Keith. Did you want to answer some of the the quick questions Emily had about the modeling choices? Sure. So uh, on the thing about Proposition 2, so we don't want to say that as their prior gets more favorable, they are more conciliatory. In fact, for a large value of like sensitivity to anger, that's not true. Uh, because if you if you gave them a real it, like if you gave them a really great prior, then they have very high expectations about what's going to happen to them. And then when they get uh, an aggressive signal, they uh, have the strongest anger response. All we want to say in Proposition 2 is if the if the prior is favorable, just meaning above the threshold where if they don't learn anything, they would take the conciliatory action, then you can't have them always taking uh, the aggressive action in response to an aggressive signal. And the reason is, uh, in an equilibrium where both sides did that, the long run probability of conflict would be one. So therefore, they're expected uh, outcome would be uh, would be conflict. So therefore, both they don't get angry because the outcome is in line with their expectations. That's the reference dependence. And they don't change their beliefs about the types of the other players but because they expected conflict with probability one. And therefore, uh, they uh, didn't learn anything by seeing conflict. Uh, so, so that's that. Uh, it's kind of like you get, you get angrier when your friends do something bad to you than when your enemies do, because you have this expectation, right, that your friends, so it's like, I don't know, like Germany gets mad that the US is spying on it. It's like, no, like we're, you know, we're out to do that, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, right. And so, yeah, and we can think more about, uh, about extending the information environment. We sort of did a like half treatment of, of this, so all we do is give them one more signal of what happened uh, one time before. Uh, That's literally what I wrote down. What if they could have two periods? <laughs> uh, and so, yeah. So the the only thing that the only thing that that does for us that I that like, uh, I, you know, I think that I that we were probably kind of focused on how it interacts with this technology that we're playing around with, but, but how that works is if you get a good signal the first time, then you raise your expectations even more. And now your anger response is stronger if you get a bad signal the second time. Okay. Uh, and so in, in, uh, with no anger, your response to getting, you're never uh, more likely to be aggressive when you get an extra good signal, uh, but, but here now you can. And uh, so, uh, and why didn't we do an agent based model? Uh, so I, I'm not very good at writing code. That's, that's one, but, uh, but. Um, I, I think that this is more, this is less me saying you need an yeah. agent based model and me saying, well, why, why is this the right way to handle this? Yeah. Yeah, you know, so I think, uh, you know, that the, the there are different advantages to these. So, uh, so we could do a much richer model if we if we were to do something like this. But in the in the approach that we take, we have, you know, the process of doing the proofs kind of tells us something about uh, about uh, a simple fable about the mechanism that's driving how people think about the psychology of other players. Uh, and so, you know, I think that that's what we wanted to achieve here. I think also like like this is kind of like our first shot at this, and so we really wanted to drill down into like these specific mechanisms and feel those apart. And so we thought this this kind of tech would be useful. I think moving forward, do, thinking about doing something like that where you can like add more richness into it because of because of the way Asian based models work could be useful. Um, as kind of like an, another subsequent project maybe something you know, that build more someone into, else right? could do this right yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe we should put that in the conclusion as yeah. Like a, yeah moving forward exactly okay awesome um so dave i think if if uh keith and carly didn't want to respond to anything else uh of emily's comments uh dave if you want to go ahead and jump in sure thanks um and thanks for the, the paper um 
so bad for Carly who's out here in my comments about stuff regarding her like twice now in like two weeks. I was um, just telling you like I need to pay David something. Like, he's just trying to be back in all my paper. No, um, no, but this is really interesting. So, so, so I had, I guess, a, a kind of a different response than I mean, it's a sense that like, like, so the framing was fine for me because I also don't need like reference to the stuff. I mean, I, I think it made sense to me overall. The one framing thing I would say is that he's a lot prone to anger and it was not clear to me there should be a parameter in the model until like the model happened. And I was like, are people prone to anger or not? Right? Is it like a thing you could be more or less of or just anger? Um, but overall, I thought that, like, I was really excited about the intro. I was like, okay, this is cool. I like the anger aspect. I like the, I like how it's affecting the behavior. I like the interaction of the strategy. That's, that's awesome. Um, and I got to the model and I mean, I don't, like, like, I got kind of confused, I guess. Like, so like, I couldn't figure, I spent a long time trying to figure out what was kind of bugging me about the model. Um, and the, the too long didn't read is all the things that, that, that I want, I'm gonna say now about the model completely don't apply to the very last um, uh, extension, which I love. <laughs> so like, if you wanna ignore everything I'm saying right now, the major takeaway is, I think that left extension is great and totally captures all the stuff in the, in the, in the model and should be the model. <laughs> Like that, that's my opinion. I, I think it's, I think it's, a, I think it's wonderful. Like I had all these comments I'm going through and I got to the very last concession. I'm like, oh, okay. So now my comments are pointless and silly. And I could just like say, this is what I think you are here, but I think you should do. So congratulations. Awesome. Let's move on now. Um, but uh, you know, you paid me on, no, no, not paid, but, but so I should, I should say the other stuff too. But, um, so I really like that one. And so, so it took me a while to figure out what exactly, um, was getting me about the first model because again I don't think it's like I like the idea in general and I like the the setup and just something particularly and and, and it was the last extension not the last the one with the two period one that that made it clear to me and and, and what it was is here's a situation in which you know with probability one right that this is a friendly person you're playing with right and you know in the first the previous period they played like the good outcome cooperate or whatever they played the C right. So, so unless you now believe that they are switching their equilibrium play, right, after having seen you play C2, right, having a good outcome for both of you happen, why would you inf get angry about the next period, a, no a signal you know is noisy, right? And that would tr cause you to, to, to now defect against them effectively, right? Be aggressive because you, you've grown angry at the signal that you've got, right? When you know it's noisy and I'm, this is not from the perspective of someone who does not, I love the behavior models, right? Like, I think they're great. I think they're important. And I love this approach in general. Um, but like even someone who like writes computational models and like you know, makes behavior models and stuff, that was hard for me to square, I think. But like, like, and what it comes down to, I think, and this is, correct me if I'm wrong on this, it is this is the, is the signal interpretation, right? This is, that was the part that I think confused me and I, I wasn't, I was still not entirely clear, I think. So maybe just my confusion here and not you at all, so you can ignore everything I'm saying. But um, the signal here was kind of, in some senses, it was very it was very similar to like the standard noisy signal in like an agency model, right? Right. So you, it's not exactly, but, but you do something and then there's a process that translates into an outcome and the outcome you're responding to in some fashion, right? But the difference here was here is, is the signal that affects your payoffs, right? It's not what you actually do, it's how it gets translated to you. Um, and, and I found that really hard to, I guess, wrap my head around. Like, why, substantively, why are you caring about the noise, right? Why is it the fact that, like, so they try to be conciliatory, but you get the wrong information, right? Or it gets passed along correctly to you somehow that, you know, there's confusion. And now you feel, and now it's effectively that you see, you think they've, they've been aggressive. Um, so I'm trying to think of the substance and scenarios in which that's the case, right? So like, what if, what if it's like a, a mobilization possibility, right? You're wondering if you're gonna mobilize in some fashion or, or, or move troops or some, something that's, that's potentially be aggressive, but doesn't have to be, right? Or they could not do that and be conciliatory and you get the wrong information about the, about the movement. That makes, that makes you angry. So I can see how that would make you angry, that information, right? Um, but why would that affect your payoffs? Because eventually you'd realize that, oh, there's no one there, right? Or you would never realize it and you're, you'd escalate yourself, right? Before you learned, and that, that's all fine. But I just, I just didn't have a good substantive story about what, what the payoffs were 
what would they connect to and why were you caring about this, this noisy signal effectively of your true behavior and not the actual like underlying, like the underlying behavior itself. And so, so and I kept coming back to that, you know, multiple times, right? Um, like, so the, the, the equation, what is it? Uh, scroll really fast here. Um, uh, so equation one, <laughs> um, so equation one, right? I spent a while trying to understand that, right? So, so here there's an identity, there, there, there's a, uh, an indicator function, right? Um, that says you only get a, you only have this anger, right? If they're actually, you know, were aggressive for real, but there is some chance that their aggression could have produced a good outcome for you. And if they, if, they, if their aggression could never produce a good outcome from you, then you don't get angry. And that that I I'm still having trouble sort of understanding that substantively, right? So 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 unless I'm just misunderstanding completely, which correct me, feel free um, uh, to do that because I could be completely wrong. Um, but it, like mathematically, like what does that mean substantively? So so I, like I think you know this only triggers when I when when you're aggressive. If this makes sense, right? And then um, you could be aggressive because there's a noisy signal that you know that there's some noise in there, right? And, and you actually were conciliatory and I didn't see it, right? Or you actually were aggressive. And I, I totally get the logic that says that you want that you're trying to capture here, in which you know if you're conciliatory, like if I expect you to be conciliatory and you're aggressive, I'm angry. That totally by 100 percent. Makes total sense. And that's why I love the last model because it's just, it's that so clearly, I think, and it makes total sense to me. Um, but, but here, right, like, why is it the case substantively that um, if your aggressive action could never have produced a good outcome for me, right, then I'm not angry at you, right? What, but if, you, if your aggressive action could have produced a good outcome for me, I don't see the good outcome, I'm, I'm angry. And I'm more angry the more likely it is to have a good outcome, right? Um, so I, I just had a difficult time around it. I actually had a similar, um, uh, I guess, I'll try to work out an alternative model before I show the last one, which I liked better <laughs> than my alternative model. Um, but I was trying to work out a sort of alternative that would sort of give similar answers, right? Um, so like, so like I was thinking of like an aspiration-based thing, right? Which wouldn't necessarily be like a, like a computational thing. So I can't say the phrase asymmetric model. I can't, I just try, I just don't like the phrase. So I just can't state it, but, um, but you could do that analytically, right? Um, and, and there, you know, so you have an aspirations that, that are somewhere between, um, you know, A and C, right? Um, aggression conciliatory and um, your aspirations adjust towards your payoff. And as things go well for you, you sort of up your aspirations. Um, towards that, eventually you might end up being aggressive because you're kind of used to good outcomes. And whenever you see something not quite as good as you expect, you get, you get kind of angry or your aspirations drop to lower um, outcomes. So eventually, even though you're getting bad outcomes, your, your um, overall expectations drop enough that you're okay with the bad outcomes. So you might eventually cons be conciliatory. Um, and sometimes you sort of play doing random chance, you end up switching your behavior there. Um, and that has a lot of the same properties, right? In the sense that it has some, you don't end up in conflict forever. Um, you have a sort of implicit anger mechanism involved um, through the aspiration thing. Um, and, you know, expectations get captured in aspirations as well. Um, it has the hedonic treadmill aspect of your, of, of your model, which like, as you go on, you sort of learn what's happening and you become like, accustomed to the bad outcomes and that lets you break free of them in a way because you're not angry anymore. Um, so it has some of the same properties, it's not the same model, obviously, but it has some of the same properties. And I, and I, I was trying to understand why, like, like why this particular example of a reference point model versus a, a, you know, other reference point models that could also capture the same stuff without making these assumptions on the signal mattering so much, which was the thing that was, that, that was, that was getting me. Um, so I get how it's rationally respond that way to the signal. So this isn't a question about like the model's solution. That's all, all cool. Um, it's just that, I just had a trouble trying to put it together or additional model could have been like, what about a repeated game with noisy signals and, and like some K period punishment standard argument, right? So, so there, you know, you see noisy signal that causes you, um, them to def you think they're defected. 
So you defect against them for all to punish them. So you have some K period of blockout where you're both punishing each other, but you jump back to the equilibrium later because the punishment's over and you end up with some bad outcomes for a while, but you're not forever in some grim trigger outcome, right? I can think of lots of sort of varieties of that that have some of the same properties, but not all. And so I was working through it for a while. And then as I said, I hit uh, whatever, model five. I was like, oh, this is great. <laughs> um, you know, I love that. I love that model. I think it's great. I think it totally, you know, you know, admittedly, I'm familiar with that model from the earlier papers and, and discussing an earlier version of that at Absa when you think. So like, I, I like that model in general. I, I like the application of the learning and that struck me substantively as exactly what sort of I would think of as anger in this context. <laughs> like that was that just jumped out at me as like, oh yeah, that, yes. Like I would not update in the same way because I'm angry. That sounds great. Like, and it works out perfectly the same way. So cool. <laughs> I'll be, you know, so sorry for saying all the other stuff because again, like, you know, I, I think in the end, I think you make the point well and it's consistent across lots of models. So one way of framing could just be to give you lots of models and say, this is a consistent result across many ways of modeling anger, um, which is cool. Um, I think we do very too infrequently look at robustness of our models, the different sort of modeling assumptions. And this is a way to, you've done a really nice job with that, um, trying different uh, modeling frameworks and getting the same basic conclusions, which is fantastic. Um, but I'll stop talking now because there's a lot of like my like being confusing and irritating probably. But uh, that was my take. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Carly and Keith, I'll let you guys respond. Uh, first, sorry. Uh, you kept saying you liked the last model, but I don't remember which model in our paper is last. Which one did you like? <laughs> uh, sorry, the information effects of anger one. Oh, sure, sure, sure. The, the motivated reason. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it just, yeah, it just, it is really, to me, it just really captured exactly what like the substance stuff at the beginning was going for. And like, it, it did a better job capturing what I was thinking of from your intro than I did in trying to capture some other model while, while trying to think through what I didn't, wasn't clear about before. So like, I think it was great. Now, obviously you don't have to listen to what I say about that one, but like, for me, that captures exactly what you're going for. I thought you were going for it first. Yeah, so regarding the signals, maybe it's like misleading to call them signals because right, they, it's not just a signal. Their payoff is equal to the, uh, so it's like, uh, I, I think of these, perhaps we should think of it less of just a signal of their action and more uh, like you might try to take a conciliatory action, uh, but fumble the ball or something. So, so we could think of it as mistakes. Um, and really, so that enters the payoff really for a trivial reason, which is like otherwise additional information is conveyed through the realization of your payoff. Yeah. And there's other fixes to that. You could just like, you could just like learn your real payoff later, uh, yeah. but you still get a payoff equal to, the, to, to what they did rather than the signal you got. So that part's fine. I think to, we can like, there, it's easy to make adjustments there. But with, I'm just trying to understand the problems with the signal. So in the anger part of the model, that indicator function that you referred to is an indicator function with respect to the actual yeah. action they took. So they're not getting mad just because they got a, uh, a, a, a bad signal. They are computing the probability given the signal that they got that yeah. the actual action yes. was aggressive and they're getting angry sort of proportional to that probability. Uh, but just, just to jump in, but they're only getting angry <clears throat> if there was a chance that they could have gotten a conciliatory action out of that action. But not, yeah, so that, that maybe that's where they, so it's not out of that action. They're going to compare to their ex ante. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so it's the probability of. But, but so this I mean, was a confused. Because yeah, the, the probability of, of getting a conciliatory action ex ante given the strategies being played, right? Um, Right. But but if for the for the first one, if they chose the if the action they chose was aggressive, right? Because the indicator function indicates that 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 equation only applies, right? It's only non-zero when the actual action they chose is aggressive. Yes, but in yeah, so I don't know if the action that they chose is aggressive. Yeah, you don't know, but 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 substantively, right? That 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 um, that value is non-zero only when it is aggressive. Correct. So 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 yeah. So I wasn't. So I, I sort of get why modeling you would include this stuff, and I'm not sort of something with that. It, it's just more like a connection to substantive to the substantive story here that I'm having trouble with in that model version of it, right? And and so so just kind of 
going back to the road. So like ex ante, like what if the equilibrium says, okay, a friendly person plays concili is conciliatory, right? That's the equilibrium, right? What's the substantive, and, and going off your example, right? Where, you know, you try to be conciliatory and you kind of messed up, mm -hmm. right? And that's fine. Um, why would I be angry, right? I know you could mess up. It's built in the model, right? So I, and I know the modeling rules because I'm, you know, I'm rational and informed about the modeling framework. So I know you could mess up and I know you're supposed to be conciliatory. So like, and, and your, your whole discussion is about intent, right? Why would I be angry? Like substantively. So if it were an equilibrium, like in an equilibrium where friendly types were conciliatory with probability one, anger would be zero. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So so the fact is that that's not the equilibrium. They okay. might be they might be not conciliatory. And so I never know for sure that they so okay. so I might I'm incorporating into my uh, yeah. beliefs the fact that they might have messed up. And to the extent that it's more likely that they were trying to be nice and just messed up, I won't be very angry. So that's what that indicator function is attempting to capture. Okay, okay, okay. So I, I say so. So yeah. So I don't think I was clear then about the the, the strategic, uh, the sort of mixed strategy nature of some of some of the strategy. Because you mentioned pure strategy above. That's why I was confused. I think it's a cutoff strategy though, and I don't see their private. Uh, okay. So I, I I see it like a mixed strategy. Oh, because the S. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So th this is actually really good because it helps us like, it's a very yeah, complicated sure. structure. <laughs> and, and so like there are definitely areas where we can clarify how this is built. Sure. And then yeah, about okay. your other comment about the, the info processing piece. So this is, this is something that we were, so basically I think what the, where the behavioral literature like comes down on what anger does and how it works is it has these kind of two different effects. It's like one anger actually just changes preferences. We become yeah, more yeah. punitive. We care about relative gains and relative losses of the other side, so on and so forth. And then the other piece is that it actually changes how we process subsequent information. And these are kind of like yeah. two different mechanisms through which anger shapes attitudes. And so originally, I think we were like, oh, we're going to do an all in one model and it's going to be great and we're going to have a million things. And then he was like, slow down, like that's impossible. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so what we did instead is what you see in the version of the paper is so we kept the, the preferences part as the main model yeah. and then did the info info processing one as the extension model. Oh, um, that makes total sense. Sorry, but so so, so I, do, I guess I guess what I, I guess now that I understand better. Thank you. Uh, probably, I guess my reaction then is the info one was really clean. Like like it, it captured that idea really cleanly and nicely, and it was like it didn't require. Now maybe this is because I I I remembered the earlier models of of the way the reasoning so it was easier for me to get in there immediately, but like here, and I wasn't familiar with Asimoglin Robinson not Asimoglin version of Walensky version of this thing. Um, but there's like there's several pieces here, right? There there's the the random S, right? Which I I have a note to myself also like why is that random? Like 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 I know modeling wise is random why it's random, but substantively like why is there a random suckers payoff but not like the other ones, right? Um. It was necessary, right? So, and then you have, so you have to deal with that. You have, you have the, the, you know, signal and or you know messing up, you know, uncertainty there. You have a cutoff strategy, and because the S is random, the cutoff strategy, you know, you don't know where you fall in the cutoff strategy, so there's going to be uncertainty in the outcome. Um, and I, th I think you're, and, and you're right. So, so you end up with the same outcome in, in which you know if they, you know, there's multiple. The cool part about the model, right, is there's multiple ways in which you can. Um, not get what you want, right? And that's the interesting part of the model, right? You know, it, it could be they it could be they're responding to uncertainty on the part of maybe their S was low or high or whatever. They could be responding to um uh you know, you know, anger. They, they could be they could be responding to previous behavior which you really know about that 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 might even be angry. There's a lot of different reasons why it could be be aggressive and those all change your behavior and strategically and that's cool. There's a lot of moving parts. Right, so, so it was hard for me to sort of identify what was happening, going on exactly, like in, in, in the model. So the model, like, it, it took it took longer to figure out, and I didn't figure it out, obviously until you, you know, explain part of that. Now I got the main points, but I couldn't figure out how the model was was supporting that, right, in, until like now, <laughs> right. Um, whereas you know, I instantly figured out how the model is supporting the lear learning learning part of that. It was like, oh yeah, okay, cool, that makes total sense, awesome.
so yeah so i guess my suggestion would be to just clarify some of that stuff up front like be, be like i would work through like here are all the pieces in the model that are driving people that, that people that actors could be responding to right that could lead them to become angry or change their their um updating of their beliefs over the over the population right and here the and you know you draw a diagram even right <laughs> Um, you know, of like, you know, here are the things that could happen that could go up or down for the different things. Um, and there's the, how the other model works, right? Yeah, for, for what it's worth, I had like kind of, when I read through, I like had kind of a similar reaction to Dave, especially when I hit the definition of anger, right? Because I think for the, for people who are like for the reviewers that you're going to get, they're going to really try to work through the formality of everything. That's where the, that's going to be like the first place where they stop. Because I spent a lot of time and I was like, and, and then I, I kind of worked through it. And I had like, a, I had some similar questions to Dave. And then, you know, I forced, you know, I was like, okay, well, I need to just read the rest of the stuff and get into the analysis. And then I came back and I understood sort of what, what the, you know, the formalized definition of anger was doing. So it might be worth like, I don't know. I, I'm a person where I just kind of like this. I mean, you, I like the way you set it up because you kind of give me all the formality and don't like interpret it as you go. And that's my that's my preference in general. But like I did stop there and I was like, I might need some hand holding um, because I'm not like, I guess I wasn't sort of clear not knowing the political psych stuff, like exactly what this was supposed to capture. Um, so like this is maybe just idiosyncratic to me, but I thought sort of an, a property that it had that was unexpected was like the idea that if you expect your opponent to be a jerk, you don't get that angry about it, right? And maybe this just says something about my own psychology, but like, you know, when I expect someone to be mean and they are mean in a predictable way, that makes me angry, right? And so like, but then I think like, that's nice because you can say, you know, that's not what we mean here. And I think that's where, that's where a lot of the value of this approach comes in right, is that, you know, these behavioral theories are usually presented verbally, it's hard to tell, you know, whether sort of exactly what the bounds of them are, and so I, I thought that was very cool, um, and then I, I have, like, one, one more thought, sort of on the, you know, what I think Keith mentioned this about the idea of, like, pitching this in some ways as, like, a methods, you know, paper where you, you, you're basically saying, like, you should do more of this, um, and these are some tools, so, like, I don't quite know how to do this but I think one one thing that you'll have to do is convince people that they could supplement the models they're writing with these tools and it's a lot easier for me to see how to change sort of a norm like a standard international relations or conflict model to incorporate the motivated reasoning technology than it is to incorporate the the technology wherein your preferences over outcomes depend directly on the beliefs so like even just a paragraph sort of like explaining to me like other situ just like highlighting some like future work like you could do it here you could do it here here's some places where you could naturally slot this technology and that would be helpful because it just wasn't as obvious to me how you could do that and like what types of settings that would be useful in uh in compared in comparison with the you know models where we're uh departing from bayesian updating it's like pretty obvious how to slot that in um but those are just you know a couple couple thoughts thanks um, so Keith and Carly, we're, we've got like a couple minutes left. I want to cut us off right at three. So do you, do you guys have any, I'll let you guys have the last, last word, anything you want to, any thread you want to pull on before we stop? No, I, don't like Keith. I think we okay. covered it. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah, thank you. This is great. Um, yeah, I, I might follow up with both of you after with more specific comment questions, but this is, this is really great. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks to both of you for the great paper. Uh, thanks, Emily. Thanks, Dave, for excellent discussant comments. Um, I, I thought we did have one comment in the chat. From a, yes, from a I will. So I'll, since we're at time, I'll, I'll pass it along to you guys afterwards, if that's cool. Okay, great. Um, so it's a good question. Um, so yeah, so uh, thanks everybody. So for all of our audience members, this is the last. Uh, this is our last meeting for spring 22. Uh, we'll be sending out a uh, call for papers over the summer. So keep a lookout for that. Until next time, thanks. Thanks. Thank you.